Okay, good morning. I will continue today where I left with the first part of Friday's class where I introduced some element of comparison and connection between the mission, the core ideas of Wikipedia and the theories, the ideas and the mission of the French encyclopedia from the 18th century. In order to do this, I will provide a bit of a historical introduction, how we get in terms of the economy and intellectual knowledge to the period before the French Revolution when this encyclopedia was produced. What are the social political factors that determine this evolution, which was a big step ahead in terms of our understanding of the convergence of knowledge and the economy. At the end of this introduction, we will look at a series of documents. We will review once more some of the pillars of Wikipedia and some of the key articles, and then look at the what is what can be considered the manifesto of the French encyclopedia, which is the entry for encyclopedia. In the entry for encyclopedia, the founders of this publication exposed what the structure should be, the template they're following, and what kind of platform this published encyclopedia was. I haven't provided yet links to the readings that you have in front of you, but I will today or tomorrow. So this is from another site, as you can see, it's not the Notion website that I have been using. And this is the introduction to this presentation. Now, in early modern societies, that is to say between the end of the Middle Ages and what can be called the Renaissance, thriving economies such as Italy, which was in the leadership at the vanguard of the Renaissance movement culturally and artistically exactly because there was a lot of wealth, Thriving economies of the period were mostly mercantile economies who, that were strongly localized. That is to say, you have places such as Florence, Venice, other city-states in Germany, and the early nation-states of France and England and Spain will follow this example where you find basically two groups of merchants doing different things and sometimes a third group doing both. A group of merchants involved heavily in importing raw materials for manufacturing of products. A group of merchants responsible for the manufacturing of products relying on the raw materials imported by the others. And then the manufactured products are exported. And it's a mercantile economy, a city such as Florence will export goods to all of Western, Central, and some of Eastern Europe, for example, and accumulate a big deal, a great deal of wealth, which you part of which you find materialized in the churches, the palaces, the works of art in the museum that you still find there to this day. A lot of labor was involved in this, right? Where before the introduction of industrialization. And there is a lot of knowledge that goes into the process of production. However, knowledge is heavily, heavily dominated by regulation and hierarchies. For example, when it comes to professional skills, the way you acquire those skills is through apprenticeship. That is to say, you're placed at the base of the hierarchy within a shop, within an office, 
within a manufacturing business. And from there, through the experience, you're trained and you can acquire some upward mobility. Even if you're built, if, even if you're born into wealth and you are the son of a powerful merchant, you're still to become the member of an organization because the same way that a single shop or a single office is organized from the standpoint of authority, going from the apprentice all the way up to the entrepreneur or the head of the business, various business-related activities are grouped together with professional guilds, for example, in Florence, which is a good example of this, you have all the butchers, members of the same guild, or the blacksmiths, all the bankers, etc., etc., belonging to the same guilds. And so in the guilds, depending on the amount of wealth you have, the amount of experience that you have, the name and reputation of your family, you have a certain amount of power. The guild works as a vehicle for the increasing of knowledge within the group, within the category, but you have to belong to it. You have to abide by its rules. And this kind of heavy localization is reflected even in the arts. When you go to Italy and you look at the frescoes with, even in the churches, even frescoes of uh, episodes from the Bible or episodes from the lives the, of, of the saints, oftentimes during this period, 15th and 16th century, the faces that you see portrayed on those paintings or frescoes are the faces of the important people of the town, are the members of the influential families. It doesn't matter whether they're playing the part of bystanders witnessing the miracle of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Augustine, or whether they play the part of apostles. They are there because there is this understanding that the community and its organization is the driving force in the managing of both the economy and the knowledge that is key to economic development of the community. Who are the merchants from the intellectual standpoint? within these communities from the 15th and 16th century in an early modern pre-industrial society. Of course, they are very family-oriented. We have plenty of evidence for, of that. For example, in the, in the case of Florence, we have a series of extraordinary family journals. The main families would have a journal documenting, chronicling the main events in the life of the family, including business including political alliances, business alliances, marriages, etc. And those journals would be transmitted, would be passed, actually, from the head of the extended family to the next person who uh, was deemed worthy of becoming the head of the family group. Extended family meaning if you have several brothers, they'll, they'll organize their community in such a way that one of the brothers will be the head of the family based on their skills. However, they tend to be risk averse. Now, we have to understand this correctly. It's a period altogether of wild capitalism. Big risks are involved in any kind of investment, right? Just imagine someone in Italy during this period or in France or Spain, for that matter, paying to uh, hire the crew of a ship to go to the Middle East and bring back materials that could be used for the manufacturing of goods. There are all kinds of possible risks and dangers. So you've committed a lot of money to this expedition, but you could lose everything. And you find some of that, for example, in Shakespearean dramas, you find references to these risks. Basically though, these entrepreneurs are risk averse because the more money they make and the less they want to risk it all. And in fact, by the end of the 16th century, you see that for example, in the case of Italy, that is well documented. 
you see that these merchants who are, have, have their life uh, deployed entirely within an urban setting, they buy more and more land because the land cannot be taken from them, whereas their money invested in risky uh, missions or uh, capitalistic ventures can disappear if the economy has a downturn. This is especially true of the Venetian merchants who between the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance are very much involved in um, economic enterprises that uh, are, are far reaching into the Mediterranean or uh, Northern Europe and then they turn into landowners because the profit is low but the risks are uh, reduced. Yes, you can lose a crop because of bad weather, but you have the land and you'll have another crop next year, right? Take the case of Florence controlled by a Medici. The Medici, the Medici family was a family of merchants and then they became the aristocrat of the city. They relied on knowledge. They understood the strategic relevance of knowledge, right? And it is within this context that you find the theories of a brilliant man such as Machiavelli who connects power to productivity, who says that the good leader is a leader who can make an efficient use of resources. And ultimately, the game of power is a game of economic growth, because without economic growth, even a leader, a dictator, a prince with absolute powers, who has absolute control and can enforce obedience and compliance in their citizens will not have power if there is no economic growth in society to support the resources necessary to create an army, to build fortifications, etc. And the best example of this dynamic relationship between power and productivity would be the Cold War, right? You have the, the Soviet Union with complete control over their citizens, perfect compliance or almost perfect compliance, right? No revolution was mounted. However, productivity lags and they lose the war, the Cold War to the US, US of A, the United States of America, because there is less compliance in that society, but much more productivity. And with productivity in society, you can spend much more in uh, weapons wars, etc. The kind of knowledge that is really appreciated within this kind of society is applied knowledge of a very pragmatic nature, right? It's not philosophical knowledge that is praised within this society. Now, we know we talked a lot about industrialization, and also, at the same time, the process of globalization, because industrialization happens in a society that is a colonialist society, right? All the heavily industrialized countries, Great Britain, France, Spain, etc., uh, are the countries who have the largest colonies. We've talked about uh, the, the steam engine, the technology that allows for, uh, for this. What are the social and political changes that occurred early on during the process of industrialization? There is one basic change that we need to look at in rules, regulations, laws applicable to the economy, to business transactions, for example. Initially, in a mercantile economy, the intervention of the state is mostly limited to ensuring the regularity of the individual transactions between a merchant and their clients, right? If anything goes wrong, then the state intervenes, there is a contract, someone who has broken the contract can be liable to consequences. With industrialization, which relies more on an infrastructure and therefore more of the social resources must be committed to preserve the growth of an industrial society, you have 
a systemic, a comprehensive look at the rules and regulations that affect the economy. That is to say, you have the beginning of this conflict that is still ongoing between the private sector and the public sector. The private sector wanted to be free to act and operate freely and to expand, and the public sector, the government, and especially the administrative agencies of the government, wanted to exercise more control, wanted to regulate the process of economic growth. In terms of culture, one of the best examples you can find to understand the new view of society, a view that is centered around the economy, that is to say that everything from politics to social interactions revolve around the idea of growth and productivity, is the Broken Glass Apolog, which was written in the 19th century by a French economist, but is reflective of the mindset, the mentality even of 100 or 150 years before this apologue, this short story was written. And it's a very simple story. So uh, the, this French economy, Bastiat, takes the example of the son of a shopkeeper who breaks a window in the shop. And of course, the father is angry because the father has to spend money to replace the window. The economist says, wait, don't look at this from the point of view of family values the son being too rowdy, not being respectful of family property. Don't look at this from the point of view of morality. Destruction is negative, right? If you build, that is positive. If you destroy, that is negative. Look at this from the economic standpoint. The, the glass was broken. Someone will have to come and fix it. Even such a menial, trivial accident becomes the engine of economic productivity. Because that glass would, would have never been replaced if it had not been broken. Without the destruction of that property, there wouldn't be any demand for a new glass for that store. So this is what economic societies of today, he's talking in the 19th century, but as I said, the reference is plenty applicable to the previous century before the French Revolution. As well, this is what modern societies are all about. Okay? And this goes on, of course, uh, plenty of articles have been written about this story, about this example, trying to show that it's a fallacy, that this is not how the economy grows. Yet, even uh, now, even in recent years, there is still interest about this kind of example. And I don't know if you are familiar with famous sociologist Sigmund Bauman, but even he talks about a similar example. If I cut the edges in my garden, instead of calling a crew of people to do the work for me, am I actually damaging the economy in this kind of world? Am I doing something wrong, something that would be frowned upon? So the discussion is still there. So what was going on in France before the French Revolution? What prompted the French Revolution? And how did the creation of the French Encyclopédie become part of this process of political and intellectual change? So basically, French society before the French Revolution was controlled by two classes with a third class in tow. The monarchy, the aristocracy, had a lot of power, but that power derived mostly from the idea of the dignity associated with the monarchy and the aristocracy, right? There was a, a lot of uh, natural respect for the institution of the monarchy, the culture surrounding the monarchy uh, was predicated about the idea of the sacred nature of the mission of the monarch as the leader of society and the aristocracy, of course, is believed to be the natural supporters of that. The other uh, class that is not mentioned here is, is the clergy, which is also part of the support system. The clergy also supports the idea that the influence, the power of the monarchy 
is uh, justified by God, is supported by God, right? God wants it. Then you have the merchants and in general, the entrepreneurs of the new industries. Now, they have a lot of accumulated wealth, especially the merchants, including cash. In fact, a lot of them during this period and even in previous centuries are involved in a lot of merchant banking, right? So they are looking for investments. Their level of dignity and prestige is kind of low, exactly because the understanding is that someone who has as a goal to become richer is, is not really part of any morally positive process. At some point, some of the merchants turn into industrialists. The industrialists, were, they, their mindset is quite different. They don't want to have cash sitting around, right? They're not wealthy in cash because they invest they want their industry to uh, expand. They need the cash to expand their industrial network and, and be more productive. Of course, for them, the existence of a monarchy, the aristocracy, and all the rules involved represent something that at best will slow down productivity, at worst will impose too many rules for example, in the case of France, the best example would be the existence of local tariffs, whereby even to move goods from one region to another within France, or to move products, you have to pay local fees. Whenever you enter a different district, a different areas, they had internal customs. And uh, up until the early 1900s in France, you would have found these buildings, these custom buildings everywhere along the roads, uh, because up until the 19th century, you were still subject to control. They would stop you, see what kind of goods you were, even as a tourist, they would stop you and see if you had any goods that could be sold locally, impose some fees with that excuse. Um, is it the sa yes. same as taxes? Or yes, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about fees because technically they're not taxes, right? say uh, you are, are bringing into uh, this uh, town a bag of coal or you're being, bringing books or whatever. So based on the amount of material that you're carrying through this territory or that has this territory as its destination, we charge you a custom fee. Okay. okay? Which means, of course, you have to stop, right? There is a waste of time, right? Because everything is subject to inspection and there is a cost to move in goods and products even within the same nation. And then, of course, this process is repeated if you send everything abroad. Okay. Then you have to pay international customs fee, fees. And you might be subject to other local fees while moving your goods through Germany or through Italy to their final market destination, right, where they will be. Okay, so the French Revolution is not just about human rights, it's not just about improvements in society, etc. It is also about in the industrial economy and the needs for that. Okay, so we know because we've studied the printing press, we know that there is a lot of knowledge that is disseminated in this kind of society. No need to rehash that. During this period, before the French Revolution, 18th century, that's when you have this intellectual revolution that is still foundational for our own culture. A lot of what you hear today in culture debate, cultural debates and political debates goes back, has its roots with the Enlightenment, okay? Including, as I said, the idea of progress. I was smiling because I read an article yesterday about Pope Bergoglio in Rome during his Easter homily. He talked about progress. And on Friday, I just said that progress was not a Christian model, a Christian idea. But even the Pope has borrowed from the Enlightenment. Even a modern Pope uh, has a mindset that is influenced by non Christian models, right? And in fact, in his homily, Pope Bergoglio said, 
Easter, of course, is a celebration of Jesus' resurrection. It looks like Jesus has not resurrected because we see so much blood, so much war, so much violence, which is exactly what I said uh, to be the non-Christian approach to the idea of progress. So that was kind of funny for some. Okay, so what is the Enlightenment about? The Enlightenment is about emphasizing rationality, reason, versus the power of traditions and whatever is being transmitted by previous generations. So the Enlightenment is saying it doesn't matter what life is being about, how people have lived before during previous generations and their values. We have to re-examine everything and see if they're useful, if those values, if those social or work routines are uh, still valid, and valid means logical, uh, founded on evidence of utility, then we keep them, otherwise we get rid of them. And this kind of reasoning in its extreme manifestation leads to uh, cutting the heads of the king and the queen and a lot of aristocrats because they find no better way of getting rid of the past for which they find no intellectual, social, or economic justification. Their idea of democracy is primarily the idea of an intellectual democracy, meaning if you have a good idea, then you are a, an equal member of this society. If you have something to contribute, then you're a member of this society. It doesn't matter whether you are born into wealth and power, in the top echelon of society, or you are a member of the lowest classes. Raw talent, raw intellectual talent, is what counts, what is being valued. But of course, the idea is that intellectual talent will lead to growth. The idea from this point on and into the next 150 years especially is that the old societies predicated on the existence of classes with different dignity, with different mobility, wastes a lot of human talent. And we have to get rid of this grid, of this social cage, so that talent, no matter where it is found, in, at what level in society, can be brought up and used and applied to the mechanisms, the mechanisms of political and economic growth in society. It is a material culture for the most part. It is a secularized culture because, of course, based on the premise, why should anyone believe the Bible simply because other people have believed in it if there is no logical foundation or scientific foundation to it? Logic and deductive reasoning is applied to everything, including human rights. And therefore, even though the human rights of the period in France or in the US are applied only to a minority of people, a small group of people in society, by logic, they can be extended to anyone, and it'll take another 100 years for that to happen, but it will happen eventually, right? And they even look at society with an intellectual approach. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, worked on these concepts the, during the previous century, and then these concepts are developed by French intellectual, intellectuals such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The idea that you have chaos at the beginning within human society because you have competing desires, and uh, the ideal state for a society is lack of conflict, and in order to get to it, you understand that there is a social con contract whereby I give up on some of my human natural rights in order to stay within a harmonious, organized society. But the individual is still the center, the owner of those human rights, right? Not the state. I've talked about the idea of con progress in uh, the culture of the Enlightenment and how it is different from cult Christian culture on Friday. If you weren't here on Friday, just watch the video. Among the various 
aspects of this culture in reference to society. They introduce the concept of tolerance, right? And respect for different cultures and different values. Of course, you have to have a comprehensive view of what is going on. Tolerance doesn't mean that the tendency is not to assimilate. That is to say, I can tolerate other cultures while they're being assimilated. So I'm not trying to eliminate other cultures, other ideas, but there is an ongoing process of assimilation that is seen as good altogether. And it's still a process. There is still a heavy process of colonization going on during this period. You can click on these links to know more about these concepts. The, the reason why during the 18th century you find a lot of literature praising uh, indigenous population is the idea that civilized societies have lost a sense of what human nature is about. And instead, anyone living closer to their primitive stage can understand this idea that the individual is the owner of all their rights, and they give up some of their rights to stay together with others. The Persian Letters is one example in a subgenre that flourished during this period whereby they pretend to write books from the point of view of foreigners. In the, in the Persian Letters, a French, a famous French intellectual, Montesquieu, uh, pretended to write from the point of view of two Persian aristocrats who visit France and have this fresh look. They don't see everything positive because it's there or because it was transmitted by other generations with their endorsement or something is positive because uh, it has the endorsement of the monarchy, of the church. They see everything as someone who's a complete outsider who therefore is allowed to ask, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Okay. And some of that will continue in the next century. For example, Tocqueville is a Frenchman who comes to the United States and has that kind of fresh look at American society. It says, why is American democracy different and more productive? What are the principles at work in here? And let's, and, and we come now to uh, our, our goal. Our destination was to understand the context, the social, historical, cultural context of this encyclopedia that was published through a period of more than 20 years, starting with 1751. This is its definition. We looked at the definition of Wikipedia. In this case, it's an encyclopedia, a systematic dictionary defined by them as a systematic dictionary of the sciences, arts, and crafts by a company of persons of letters, where persons of letters means intellectuals, right? Or even excerpts, experts, okay? And there is a lot of emphasis from the single keywords in the definition on applications of knowledge and applied science in general. The encyclopedie was directed by Diderot, who was another famous intellectual of the period, and then D'Alembert came on board. Here, too, you find two founders, so to speak, the same way that you do with Wikipedia. Altogether, within those 20 class years, they produced 20 volumes of this encyclopedia with almost 72,000 articles, more than 3,000 illustrations, and illustrations often of a technical uh, nature, right, to illustrate how technologies work. They sold 4,000 copies, which seems nothing, but it was a lot for that kind of publication, and 28 volumes were very expensive. And within that kind of society, that would, uh, at some point, prompt uh, the, the manifestation, the political, insurrection that led to the French Revolution. Being able to influence a few thousand readers was a lot considering how many people were part of the top echelon in society. That is, that is to say, not too many. They recognized the 
political nature of this publication. So it was banned, it was condemned, but it carried on. And even during the period when it was banned, it was published uh, and they pretended that it was being published uh, somewhere else, not in France. Their goals, to change the way people think, to make knowledge accessible to as many people as possible in order to empower the reader. The goal is actually very similar to Wikipedia and the digital platforms of today. These are the key principles and then we'll look at their manifesto and compare it briefly to the manifestos of Wikipedia. In their case too, as in the case of Wikipedia, definitions are key. Every Wikipedia article starts basically with a definition. Even though Wikipedia will tell you we are not a dictionary, but the definitions are very relevant as it is the language, the style in general used within each entry. So there is a designing principle. Entries are similar in terms of style and structure, same way as in Wikipedia. It is a knowledge project that is open-ended because the idea is that this is something that is placed in the hands of future generations who will be able to expand it, revise it, infuse new knowledge into it. It's open-ended also because it refers to ongoing debates when uh, the agreement is not there on intellectual issues or even unresolved areas of scientific knowledge. It's somewhat customer oriented. <laughs> Clearly they are talking not to any reader, but to a middle class reader or upper middle class reader. Their purpose is to make the reader a better member of society, more mature, and therefore more efficient, more productive member of society. This idea that there is talent and the church the leadership, the government, the school system are not able to tap into that talent. Therefore, we need to continue, they thought, we need to continue with what the printing press started, self-education. Someone who has received a basic education can use this platform to get a better, a higher level of knowledge and come up with brilliant ideas that will make society more productive or the industrial system more productive. The principles, the internal principles, the encyclopedia itself was collaborative, right? On a smaller scale, it's not crowdsourced, right? We're talking about 60, 70 people at any given time, a few hundred people across those 20 years. They even believe so much that they say there is no other way to create this uh, kind of knowledge platform than with engaging a group of experts. It's based on primary experts, not like Wikipedia, in which case anyone uh, with secondary or tertiary knowledge can work on it. They want experts with direct expertise in a field. Clearly, no crowdsourcing here. Compared to Wikipedia, they allow programmatically in their manifesto, they allow for criticism, they even allow for irony. Why? Because they're not neutral? No, it's simply because they live in a censorious society. They live under a king. They don't live in a democracy. So they know that irony can be the best way to attack traditional institutions, for example, the church, that they cannot attack frontally, directly. So they can do it in an ironic way, hoping that the ambiguity will protect them from the consequences. Okay, and we'll look at a couple of examples of this kind of irony. In terms of their mindset and how we moved away from the hyper-localized administration of knowledge, business-related knowledge in city-states from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, they have this broader view of knowledge and how 
it applies or supports economic development. For example, they want a system of patents that would allow anyone to access the knowledge that allows a technology to be developed. They want the state to become the repository of patented technologies, but then they want the state to disseminate that knowledge, which is not exactly what's happening even now, right? Because in the patent to a technology, not all the details are included. You cannot use a patent necessarily to reproduce a technology. Technology is very relevant within knowledge in general in here. So they already have a penchant for knowledge of that kind. And learning for them too is also visual. They have illustration for that reason. But again, it's not just so that I understand, so that I can see and reproduce, or see and invent another technology. The encyclopedia itself is also a place where you start seeing a widespread systematic use of links. Of course, these are not clickable links, but you have links everywhere, links to other articles. So you start at any point with any entry and you're directed to other entries. You have these connections. Links to the sources, to the primary, secondary, and tertiary sources of the encyclopedia. Same thing. It's not the place for new material. It's very structured much more than Wikipedia. There is a tree of knowledge at work in here and a pyramidal organization of the areas of knowledge. And together with direct links, see this, see that, there are also indirect references that connect any article to other articles. I can show you the link because it, it's now dead. So I'll have to find another example of the tree of knowledge. I've included a series of links where E marks the encyclopedia, W marks Wikipedia, so that one can compare the entry for philosophy, woman, or adore, adoration between the two of them. I've included this because, of course, religious matters, references to the church, were very important for encyclopedia in their kinds of society. For now, I'll let this be because I want to go to other documents First, and this is the end of the introduction, we'll look now at, we'll review quickly Wikipedia's manifestos and then the entry for encyclopedia that you find uh, there. Uh, as far as previous example of linking, they themselves make reference to the Vocabulario de la Crusca, which is one of the first dictionaries in European history, modern dictionaries. And if you click on this, you can see, even though it's in Italian, you can see that the definitions associated with the meaning of a word are inclu include references to other entries in the dictionary together with a series of sources. This is a dictionary it's heavily based on sources, that is to say, in order to understand how conoscenza, knowledge, also has the meaning of news, being aware of something, knowing something, cognition. You have a series of examples where those meanings are placed in a context. So they themselves are connected, the authors of the French encyclopedia, to a tradition that emerged with the printing press because the first edition of the Vocabulario de la Crusca dates back to the end of the 16th century. For now, though, I want to re-examine with you, and later you will find that link in the lesson plan. This is the entry about Wikipedia, where some of the self-definition of Wikipedia are presented, and so we'll review it briefly. Wikipedia is an online free content encyclopedia helping to create a world where everyone can freely share and access all available knowledge. And we're just focusing our attention 
on these passages because then we'll read from the Manifesto of the French Encyclopedia. Okay, and, and that is pretty much almost everything we need for now. Perhaps this passage, Wikipedia is written collaboratively by largely anonymous volunteers. Anyone with internet access and in good standing can write and make changes to Wikipedia articles, etc. <coughs> We can also look at the five pillars, which I mentioned before, and I couldn't find them in an earlier class uh, last week. The five pillars is a condensation of all the principles you find across several articles of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, right? And, and, and then everything else Wikipedia is not is taken from that manifesto written by Jimmy Wells, entitled Wikipedia is not. Then the other pillar is Wikipedia is written from a neutral point of view. Wikipedia is free content that anyone can use, edit, and distribute, which is the combination of free and also an open-ended kind of enterprise, right? An ongoing process, still open to expansion and revision. Wikipedia's editors should treat each other with respect and civility. And finally, Wikipedia has no firm rules, which is another way to specify that Wikipedia is an open-ended platform. Meaning they have rules, they have policies and guidelines, but those policies and guidelines are themselves subject to addition, revision, expansion, changes in general. This is the other manifesto, which we've reviewed together. Wikipedia, what is not Wikipedia. And for now, we'll just go to the manifesto of the French Encyclopedie, which is the entry for encyclopedia. They start with the definition of the word, as we should have expected, and as it is the case for Wikipedia. This word, encyclopedia, signifies chain of knowledge and they provide etymology. Number two, paragraph two. The purpose of an encyclopedia is to collect knowledge disseminated across the globe, around the globe, and, and that is an almost perfect match to what Wikipedia is about, to set forth its general system to the man with whom we live, so right away we have this idea of knowledge placed within society, right? Which is not exactly the knowledge society, but we're getting there. And transmit it to those who will come after us. So it's open-ended, right? Has to be continued by other generations. So that the work of preceding centuries will not become useless to the centuries to come. So that our offspring becoming better instructed will at the same time become more virtuous and happy. Happiness is something you find referred to even in the US Constitution of the same period. And we should not die without having rendered a service to the human race. So this idea of growth is implied in the last statement. And I'll go through this for the next five minutes and you can, you will find this linked in the lesson plan after I modify it, I've highlighted some key ideas and passages. You can read the rest as you want. So they want to cover everything related to human curiosity, duty, needs, and pleasures. Where duty is an indirect reference to responsibilities, therefore to morality, ethics, right? The things that you should do. It cannot be the work of a single man, right? There has to be some collaboration. And they acknowledge that it is based on the structure of previous dictionaries of language, such as the dictionary of the group known as Academia de la Crusca from Florence. What is the dictionary of a language? What is a lexicon, even executed as well as it can be? A precise collection of the articles to be filled in by an encyclopedic and analytical dictionaries. That is, 
That is to say, if you take a dictionary, you find there already words that should become entries in this encyclopedia, which is very true of Wikipedia also, right? You have a lot of generic, the entry for language, philosophy, politics, etc., etc. They're all there, right? The same entries you would find in a dictionary. This is the part about collaboration. I do not believe it is given to a single man. This is the founder who's talking, right? Who wrote this. All that can be known to make use of all there is, to see all that can be seen, to understand all that is intelligible. And with emphasis on use, on the application of knowledge. You need a group. What is the structure? Like, all the terms must be defined. You always include a definition, but it is not just a definition. Who will exactly define the word conjugate if not a geometrician? They're talking about conjugation in mathematical terms. The word conjugation if not a grammarian. The word azimuth if not an astronomer. Meaning, we need experts from various fields. In this regard, of course, Wikipedia is vastly different. In here, you find reference to something you've read in the first textbook by Peter Burke about the social history of knowledge, the distinction between discovery and invention. But those things are seen as very close to one another. Applied science, applied knowledge is one of the focal points of this culture. And this is part of the mission to assemble bring together all that has been written on every subject, synthesize it, illuminate it, make it clear, concentrate it, order it, and publish treatises in which each item would take up only the space it deserves. So this is what they're trying to do that was done with multiple books before, right? And, and they developed the same concept together with the idea of bringing together experts from various fields. They want to do it from the bottom of society, without the government. Of course, it's the government they criticize, right? If the government participates in such an opus, it will not get done. It should use its influence only to favor its execution. With a single word, a monarch can make a palace arise from the grass, but a society of men of letters is not like a herd of manual laborers and you see here the political ideology at work, right? The democratic ideology at work, and you understand how this was at times banished, banned, or, or uh, the, the, the sale of the encyclopedia for prohibited. They know that they have to deliver a published work within a certain amount of time. This kind of reasoning you find also in the articles about Wikipedia. But they know that whatever they publish is not the end of all there is about that particular entry. That which will lend the opus an outdated feel and cover it with scorn is above all the revolution that will take place in men's mind and the national character. The intellectual revolution is also a reference to the political revolution that will happen within about 20 years from the publication of the last volumes. Okay, and this is another reference to how this is open, that progress will make some changes necessary uh, to the encyclopedia and uh, I'll stop here because I still have a few passages, but I cannot finish in just one minute.